Hello, my name is Tori Stevens, and I am the creative manager of climate fiction at Grist Magazine, which is a nonprofit media organization that's been around for actually 25 years this year. And the media organization I work for is focused on climate justice and solutions and has been doing that, communicating to people. We have investigative journalism, news articles, and reporting on the climate crisis. But we usually come at it from a frame of you know, those three points that I was talking about, climate justice and solutions. And, but we further go into this, we, we have a narrative that is one that is about hope and solutions and not being invested in doom and gloom. But we also do reporting on the news side. So sometimes it is not as rosy as we would like, but we definitely have a lot of articles in news that is hopeful, uh, focus on the solutions, highlighting people doing things about the crisis out there in the world. And so the project I manage is very different than news. It's still in the storytelling business, as we like to say. It is a project called Imagine 2200 Climate Fiction for Future Ancestors. And so that project is really interesting. It's a climate fiction initiative that is reaching people across the globe, activating writers to write imaginative and futuristic stories about how we can get out of this crisis. So <clears throat> today, though, I want to talk about the project for sure, because uh, the project is going to lean into the things that I'm going to talk about and exemplifies it. So the things that I would like to talk about are collective visioning, collective discussion of hope and collective curating of climate fiction stories and the need for more storytelling in the climate space. So that takes a collective effort. And so I'd love to talk about that as well. So again, we're going to talk about collective visioning, collective discussion of what hope means and what wrangling with that collectively with your community and others does for the for you for your community for the planet um i think you get a different result than when you think about hope on a personal level and we'll talk about that as well and then climate storytelling and why we need a thousand points of light or a million points of light from a variety of perspectives to talk about this crisis and talk about ways out of it and about how we can get to a clean, green, and just future. So let's start with the visioning piece. And I guess I'll start first by talking about my personal entrance into visioning. I would say that I wasn't a person that I come from the, before joining Grist as their creative manager of climate fiction, I was a storyteller for many years. And the storytelling that I did was for appeals. These letters, now you get them as uh, emails, but when I was doing them, I'm dating myself, but that's okay. I started out in the business of writing appeals, letters that went out to people in, they received them in their mail. Uh, so we used to call it snail mail. And I used to send out 60 to 65,000 letters a year for various causes. The first one that I worked on and with and where I really cut my teeth is with the protection of HIV and AIDS, like individuals with HIV and AIDS, and then like so that there's funding and uh, resources for those folks, because a lot of the funding came from the federal government and the states. And then we also sent out these appeals so that individuals could help folks that are living with HIV and AIDS or help fund the money that goes to preventative care so that folks don't get HIV, education, basically. Um, and so, you know, I cut my teeth doing that work for a long time, was writing a lot of stories, and then moved into the health advocacy space, largely protection of the Affordable Care Act, the Medicaid and Medicare, making sure that those programs were robust, working for people and aren't under attack by folks on the right. And so, 
that's where I lived. Uh, you know, storytelling was definitely something that I uh, was doing for a long time, 15 years. And it was every few months I had to write another story, interview someone. And what I learned was that, and I'll get to visioning, but I think it's important to talk about this part, this part as some background as to who I am and like how this makes sense for climate fiction and where I entered the picture. Um, so I was telling all these stories, but I was using a lot of statistics and narrative arcs that were about the organization and not really that much about the people that we were working to help and assist and, you know, garner resources for. But I fell upon this website or more of a Facebook blog. It was called Humans of New York. And Humans of New York, if you don't know it, I think many of you all will know, do know it. But it was a project that was focused on interviewing a random person in New York and just broadcasting that to the world. Like, here's this person, here's what they've been doing in New York and their life and they're interesting and let's hear about them. And they were really engaging. And I thought, let, I want to bring that sort of engaging storytelling to advocacy work and fundraising. So fast forward, I did that, that, you know, accomplished that, was able to kind of make that argument in the space for storytelling that was not really there. It was really about like the big wins that folks had made for the particular, you know, cycle. Was it a year since we last communicated with you? So here's the things that we've done in the past year, or here's the things that we've done in the last three months. And they were very like statistic. This art organization served a thousand people. I didn't want to hear that. And I didn't think it was moving. I wanted to hear about like the person, you know, the end user, the one who was being helped. And so focusing on one person, Brenda, I'll use that person as like a kind of composite fake person, but I wanted to hear about Brenda's family, how get receiving this um, life-saving medicine helped her and her child or whatnot. So fast forward to Gris. I land the job at Gris. I'm very excited because I really, uh, after applying and working with these folks on a consultant project, I, I was like, this is where, where I want to be. And part of the reason I wanted to be in the climate space is because I recognized that the climate issues that were affecting folks in the Gulf, because I was focused at one time on the Deep South and how that uh, the healthcare advocacy work that I was doing was focused on the Deep South. And so I came into contact and knowing about Cancer Alley and the issues, you know, you could also bring up Katrina and the hurricanes that have hit like the Deep South and the response to that. But for me, Cancer Alley was like a wake up uh, call for the intersection of public health or health and individual's health and how the climate can impact that. So I was all in because I've always wanted to like the space I've been operating in since I graduated college, which was quite some time ago at this point, was I wanted to help people have better lives, you know, and so people's health was one of the, you know, top priorities for me. Um, and so in that space, I, you know, worked in it for a while, moved over to climate fiction um, at Grist, but they didn't have a climate fiction initiative at the time. What they had was an idea that they wanted to do something different at Grist. And so I was brought on to bring together a whole bunch of people to have a retreat where, you know, we would talk about the climate crisis, um, climate solutions for sure, justice that is happening across the United States in a variety of spaces and sharing that so that folks can kind of have some intel on the ground of like, what are the new, you know, fights um, for on the justice front, what are the new climate solutions coming to bear? And at the end of that, we tacked on one last exercise that at that time was not a visioning exercise. It was more of a brainstorming exercise. And that brainstorming exercise asked them, the folks that were participating, and I was a participant and a consultant, so kind of weird, but fun too. I got to participate. Um, and the last question for the day was, if Gris could, Gris, the media organization I work for, if they could launch something new 
what would it be? You know, like we do news. There's, you know, won awards, beat the New York Times in a, awards at times. And, you know, but <clears throat> at the same time, there's this issue where we're reaching a lot of people, but we're reaching a lot of the people that already kind of know that the the climate crisis is an issue, that we need to, you know, limit the amount of carbon that we're spewing. And so um, what what's, so we put people into groups and small groups, kind of discuss among yourselves, pitch an idea, select one that you think is the best, and then bring it up to the full group. So we had five ideas that, you know, folks thought of and generated and brought up to the um, front of the stage, if you will. And so the idea that really sat with us after, there was a few ideas that were just like really great, but just weren't a great fit for Grist was the one that was, though, was climate fiction. It was something that the founder of Grist, Chip Geller, had been already noodling on and was thinking of, you know, as something that would be interesting to bring at Grist, bring to Grist. And, you know, it wasn't weird because it's not like a whole, like we have editors. The New York Times has like a fiction section. The New Yorker does. Like, it's not weird for like a news organization to launch something in the fiction space. So, we walked away with that, had some internal discussions, and I was put kind of as as the person, the point person to kind of explore this and then launch this new project if it's something that like upper management and the team looking at this, me and a few others, you know, thought like, yes, this makes sense. Yes, the, you know, we can do this from a budgetary kind of like standpoint, and we think there's an audience there. So we did all those kind of looking around. But the main concern I wanted to know was, and the question I wanted to answer, and I couldn't answer, was what kind of climate fiction? Just like climate fiction, any kind of climate fiction, hopeful climate fiction, visionary climate fiction, really wanted to know and answer that question. And so worked with some folks that <clears throat> develop, um, they help develop teams think through creative ideas and one of the facilitators said, why don't we bring back a group of people similar to the people that you, you know, convened at this uh, retreat and have them kind of discuss climate fiction and we can set it up in a visionary, like it's a visioning session so that, you know, you're getting people's ideas, you're um, exploring the topic collectively, and a lot of variety of perspectives will come to the surface. And I really just, again, I, I, I didn't think that visioning was a, um, I, I really hadn't used it as a tactic to kind of supercharge anything in my life. So I didn't really, I was skeptical, right? And so I, we moved on because it seemed like a really brilliant idea to bring all these folks together to discuss climate fiction, but I didn't really understand what visioning can do. And so in our conversations, when we're designing and co-creating the event that would become, actually we called that event Imagine 2200, because what we realize is that when you take a group of people or an individual and you uh, have them focus on something that is so far off in the future, it opens their mind to be able to think in a way that it, it, it makes it a lot more expansive for them to be able to think and dream in a way without constraints right and so that's what we wanted we wanted like a no holds bar just dream with full abundance and possibility and the goal we set was we want the world to be clean green and just by 2200 what do you see that meaning to you and this is where I think we did some things that I really would love to for you all to take and maybe even copycat um, because I think it's just was brilliant. Not my idea, but something that um, came to fruition in the process of creating this Imagine 2200 online visioning uh, session so that we could figure out what climate fiction at Gris would be. And so the idea that one of the facilitators, his name is Adam Burke. I can put in, uh, I can have these folks put his name in the show notes. He 
used to play Dr Dungeons and Dragons, um, a role playing game. I didn't play that growing up. I just never encountered that. I knew I know of it, but I don't really know the mechanics of it and how it works. And he said, what if we combined Dungeons and Dragons style role playing in or just role playing in general, not Dungeons and Dragons style, but the mechanics, you know, that you're going to go on a quest. There's a goal. There's a kind of uh, dungeon master or uh, a portal um, master, as we called it in this uh, session that we created. And let's put people on this quest to get to a clean, green, and just world, create a timeline that we put on the wall. Um, or And we ended up transitioning this whole thing. It was supposed to be an in-person event. And we transitioned to um, it being online because of COVID, uh, because of the pandemic. And so his idea was to merge visioning with a timeline that we would put on, uh, we ended up using a white online whiteboard um, called Miro. And one, if we squished that also with visioning. So those three things together, in plus the people. So the people and the people I should talk about too. These folks are uh, from a wide variety and diverse background from their you know, who they are as a person, um, the lived experience they have, and then the sector they come from. So I think that was like, I should have emphasized that a little bit more, but that was like super important. Um, but, you know, the goal was to have, you know, a variety of people there, you know, from kelp farmers to activists to um, folks working on, um, you know, plastic eating amoebas and, so scientists and biologists and, um, you know, nonprofit uh, folk that have kind of like been working on a particular issue in their area, maybe it be water or clean air. Um, but the, the goal was to have a, folks that are focused on climate solutions, justice, uh, and bring all those folks together that are in these different sectors, have these, have them go on a quest with the uh, the not the project, sorry, with the portal manager. I forget what the name was, but it was like portal guide manager or whatever, but just like some sort of guide, that person was there to help you stay on track. Um, you know, they they didn't offer input into how your timeline would be managed, but they had they helped them when it was like next person's turn and things of that nature. But the mechanics of the game really helped. And we developed them um, very well, and I'm happy to share them with anyone who requests those. So, you know, I can put that request also in the show notes because I think it was, you know, it's just like a really brilliant way to kind of generate ideas and perspectives and collect them um, and engage with other people's dreams. We call them dream seeds. And yeah, in, you don't often engage with other people's dreams, but you do in story. You know, like that's why people create stories is so you can see like, you know, sometimes it's for entertainment, but oftentimes there is like, this is my dream of something or, you know, that's just like a a, a mechanic of um, storytelling is that people's dreams are kind of infused into the story. Not always, but um, in a decent amount of them. And so uh, these folks for two and a half days went on a collective visioning quest where they were documenting their ideas and milestones that they felt humanity would have to take, um, you know, from the jump, like we, we the year one was 2020, uh, and then all the way 180 years in the future, which landed us in 2200. So they're imagining everything be between now or then and 2200 in the on the board, which was enlightening for me, was later after I collected and reviewed, like then after I had three or four months to sit with people's timelines, distill it and figure out what we're going to pull into being the prompt, the call for submissions. Because in the end, Imagine 2200 ended up becoming not a, excuse me, not a project where we're just contracting out stories and um, having writers write, and then, you know, we publish the story on a, a certain cadence. What we did is we wanted to activate a, a lot, globally, a lot, yeah, we were ambitious, ambitious. So we wanted to activate a community of people 
um, across the globe, to writers, to submit their stories, and it became a contest, a, a contest to kind of find the best um, stories that embodied what I had to distill at the time, which were the the I had to make the 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 prompt that would generate this type of story. And what I learned from the visioning process is the perspectives and the things that I would have never added, right? So climate fiction wouldn't have been as more climate fiction at grist wouldn't have been as robust and dynamic if I hadn't done this project. So the things that, you know, I, I knew there were things that people brought to the table, like the abolition movement, you know, to, you know, limit the amount of people in prison and ultimately get to a world where there are no prisons and that people can kind of adjudicate their issues with each other through um, other means other than just being punished and locked down. So abolition movement came up in many of the timelines as like something that humanity, humanity, excuse me, needed to accomplish to get to a clean, green, and just world. Reparations for Black folk, um, that was in some of the dream seeds that people uh, seeded, you know, it, on like a sticky somewhere it said, 2070 reparations was finally given to black and brown folks whose um, ancestors were enslaved and you know things like the land back movement i knew of it but i didn't think about you know adding that to our prompt or like you know name checking it as something that's important that folks should like know about if they're going to submit a story because it might be a story that they want to um you know, a, a, a plot, a theme, or a, or a full story about the land back movement, you know, I wouldn't have known about that. So there are all these different persons in a ton of climate solutions that I just didn't have on my radar. So sitting with these timelines, and it was a lot of information to absorb, but I had the time and, and I was reading them and they were interesting. And we had some, we had scribes that were drawing things um, for each of the groups. So there was like some pictures to look at or illustrations. And in that, I could see not just people's collective dreams, but their collective hopes, right? And so I thought, I felt like, wow, I've never really explored the, the, the asp I've never explored hope collectively. Um, and so this visioning process opened up another thing for me, but just to end the story on like where we ended with our prompt is that our prompt for Imagine 2200 and be, ended up becoming so much more than what it would have been if I hadn't had this visioning session with these amazing and incredible people. And, you know, at times, because um, we've been running this project for three years now, it's three years old now. It's um, we've received uh, close to 3000 stories. We've published close to 40 stories and uh, there have been 36 winners. Um, for, so for each year, we publish 12 stories. There's a first place winner, a second place winner, a third place winner, and then uh, nine finalists. And so we've have run it for three years. So we have 36 stories and these visions that now we can collectively share that embody the collective dreaming envisioning that came through during the pandemic and with a group of people that didn't know each other and had to go on a quest with each other is something quite amazing. It is nothing that I had ever been, um, uh, I'd never done anything like this before. And I really, till this day, it is, um, generating creativity and thoughts and ideas for me that I will be ruminating on for years and pursuing and trying to investigate um, and also advocate for. You know, I'm now more of an advocate for some of the ideas that I encountered. You know, I consider and should have always considered the folks, like I didn't really know too much about land back and now I'm an ally to the land back, like indigenous folks who are um, who are looking, indigenous and non-indigenous folks who are looking to seed land, get lands back into the hands of the folks that, um, you know, whose land it was originally, the indigenous folks. And so, so that's visioning. I really hope that people reach out to me after they watch this and say, hey, I would love the mechanics of that game so that I could view it 
um, and maybe even use it for a visioning session because I think this vision, this collective visioning is not just for storytelling. I think it could be useful for policy discussion. I think it could be useful, useful for um, anything where you want to think about how do we move forward and how do I gain outside input? And you could call that brainstorming, but I think it goes much deeper than that when you're asking things. It's about the goal at the end being clean, green, and just. Um, to me, a brainstorming session is a little bit more limited, but you know, maybe it's just a semantics issue. So now let's talk about hope and collective hope. And then I'll move over to why I think we need what I call a thousand points of light of storytelling, climate storytelling. Um, and so, and that has to do with narrative, sure. But before I do that, the piece around hope is, I always say this thing, like, after I did this visioning session, I got really, I was like, oh, I'm allowed, I, I was able to like view these people's hopes and dreams. And I never really had a way of doing that, right? I, and, and then I connected the two from my, earlier life, when I used to interview people, the question I would ask them was, what do you hope our organization, this charity, this these resources will do for your life? What's your hopes and dreams, essentially? And then with the visioning project, we, you know, we hoped that folks would dream about a clean, green, and just future. And doing that collectively, you've got this like patchwork and of all these different hopes and dreams. And I was able to explore those through the timelines and stickies that people had, um, digital stickies that they put on the timeline. And so after that, I really wanted to explore, had anyone explored what it means to collectively discuss hope? Because I know that my idea of what hope is was, I wouldn't call it superficial, but it was it definitely wasn't as dynamic and as robust and as like interesting, I guess. To me, I, I don't know. I sometimes call it like it's a hope that was limited in its capacity. And so I also only had my idea of hope, right? And so exploring hope collectively in the past few years, not through just people's stories, but intentional discussions around what does hope mean to you with my family, my friends, my community. And I say that now, I was, I don't know if nervous was is the right word, but it was like weird, right? I was like, I really want to talk to people about what I'm doing in my work and about hope. But then when I bring up like hope and talking about hope, it's a weird thing. Like, I think like I used to be evangelical when I was like smaller and it's like talking about faith. Like, I didn't like I as a Christian at the time when I was Christian, it, it wasn't weird to talk about faith, but I think it's like if you're a non-Christian, it does come off as like kind of like this thing about faith. Like what is like I don't know. It, to me, there's like some similarities into how I felt around hope. I felt like it was weird to discuss hope with people either as um an individual like one-on-one, -on -one, um, with like even family members, like my brother or sister, if I was like, hey, like. Like, they'd just be like, what? What are you talking about? I could give them context and tell them that I'm talking about, excuse me, about this project. And that's where I came upon this. But I still think, like, it was a little bit weird. So I started just being weird and, like, asking people, like, you know, if you could hope for a better, better, better future, and if you could hope for a clean, green, and just world, what would that look like to you? And so, yeah, it's not, like, the best party um, discussion, but I ended up having these conversations like more intentionally with like folks that I thought um, would be interested in having these discussions, you know, scheduling Zooms with people and just going back and forth and talking about hope. Um, and then, you know, I moved that into doing that with like more people instead of just like one-on-one -on -one with people that I don't know, but respect um, in the climate storytelling space, and then decided to do that like on a an informal level, but still like, you know, trying to just understand what happens when you get people into a room and you discuss hope um, collectively. And some really interesting things happen, similar to the visioning. There's perspectives, again, that are um, brought to the fore that are not ones that I would have 
ever inter not inter I just didn't come across them and that's what happens and that's why I appreciate um diverse perspectives from you know folks that are you know um you have a different um upbringing um come from a different walk uh, or walk a different life than mine um and so now I'm all in and I like think that collectively thinking about hope envisioning in other things, you know, to discuss those, you know, the way we discuss things online um, in, you know, uh, comments or, you know, through social media. Um, I think that's great, but I think there's something to be said to be talking about in picking a, 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 a important focus that we need to think about because society, I don't think society talks about hope that much, right? And so in, in society doesn't talk about visioning that much. Like they're just kind of seen as things that are not um, important, but I think they're very important and they've been like kind of pushed to the side. And so I think they're a superpower that uh, at least this visioning piece is a superpower and hope is just something that like, I think we need to focus on more. And so, you know, you know, get a fire going, um, sit under the stars, talk about visioning the, your vision for the future, even use the prompt. Like, what do you think um, a, a clean, green and just world is? And how long does it take for us to get there? Or even just tell them if we needed to get to 2200 and be in uh, and have the world be clean, clean, green and just, you know, what do you think we would need? And that will generate a really good discussion that I think a lot of people need to be having. Um, and so uh, I suggest people do that with visioning and I suggest people do that with hope. And so the last section of this is gonna be on climate storytelling. Over the past uh, three years, I've been able to read a ton of short stories around climate fiction and you know, hopeful sto short stories. And I love that. I love that we limited the window at, I have nothing against dystopian stories. In fact, some of my favorite stories are dystopian. I love the movie Mad Max, can't get enough of it, um, Fury Road, and some of the older ones as well. However, and I think that dystopian stories have a serious role to play in our uh, collective discussion around the world that we don't want, right? Um, dystopian stories highlight the things that we don't want. But I think that we haven't invested enough energy, time, and um resources to the story the 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 world we want to live in so what is that future that we want you know what does it look like what does it taste who's who's in that story um i remember and this is like just a piece of like storytelling and this is so small but it was so big there's a artist and i'll put the name in the show notes because right now i can't remember their name but it basically said um, they they created a billboard that said there will be black people in the future or there are black people in the future. And it was just like a small, like it's short. It was a billboard. And, but because I'm thinking about climate fiction, science fiction, and reading all these stories, um, you know, when I say reading all these stories, leading up to launching Imagine 2200, I had to read a lot of short stories that were not obviously grist. Um, material and didn't have this prompt. I just read a ton of speculative fiction, science fiction, and climate fiction, and wanted to just get a feel for the space. And there, a lot of the characters and the worlds were, the characters were bland. The worlds were built in such a like detailed and organized, and you you felt like you could, you're there. But where was the culture? Where were the you know ethnicities and nationalities and diversity and uh, sexual orientation um, that I find in my world? Like all the different people in my world that I'm interacting with that make this world dynamic, um, beautiful. Uh, that whole fabric was you know not from the whole genre because I don't want to paint a picture that the whole genre, but there was not not much of that going on, and so with the stories that we've been receiving because we limited the the pipeline and we said, here's what we want and here's what we don't want. We don't really describe what we don't want, but we're not looking where we're looking for hopeful stories. We're looking for stories that have climate solutions embedded in them. We're looking for culturally authentic stories that 
are from the people um, of the cultures that we're talking about, or if they're not, then they're people who are engaged with those folk um, and have a high respect for those folk and want to uh, depict those folk in a beautiful way because they recognize that there's not enough depictions of marginalized people, oppressed people, black and brown people, BIPOC folks in general. Um, or even just like uh, crafty individuals who are trying to make a um, a better world. Uh, you know, those depictions are not showing up in our stories, in our films, and we need a robust pushback and or creation. I wouldn't even call it a pushback. I would just we need a creative process, uh, you know, where there's a thousand flowers blooming or a million of them across the globe with a variety of perspectives on hope, our future, and how do we get to a clean, green, and just world? I think that climate storytelling and storytelling in general that is focused on the climate is an underutilized climate solution. I'll say that again. I think that climate storytelling is an underutilized climate solution, and here's why. Climate storytelling engages people's brain in a different way than news does. It also helps people envision like the reality of the world, the hopeful style uh, in the one that's focused on climate solutions helps people envision the world that we want and could have if we just get it together and work towards that. And if we don't have those depictions, if we don't have those dream seeds, you won't have an expansive view of the future or perspective on the future or the future that we could have. Um, and, you know, that it's similar to like when I was working on trying to get uh, or dream up climate fiction at Grist. I, you know, I had a limited view because I had limited perspective and I wanted to gain more perspective. We humans, humanity, society, I think have a limited view of what our future could look like because we're not dreaming about it or interacting with other people's dreams and reading stories and creating stories that collectively help us get to that beautiful future. So please go out there and have hopeful conversations with people close to you, with people that aren't close to you. Organize like a community event at your library where you talk about hope and getting to a clean, green, and just world, I think that is really important in this time. Um, and then if you're bold and really have the time and you're in your, um, like in your profession, you know, use game mechanics, role-playing game mechanic, role-playing game um, mechanics, excuse me, use those and add visioning to it and, and create something new. I it, You could use some of the stuff that we have. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, it's really well done. And I th even think that it could be fine tuned um, or changed. But I, I think there's something to the creative process of co-creating a event um, for your colleagues to dream and ideate and think through what's the next big campaign we're gonna do? What's the next product we're gonna launch? I always say this, I think that, and it doesn't just work for creative projects, but because I'm involved in the kind of creative um, field, visioning will supercharge your creative project in a way that I don't think anything else could, you know? Um, and yeah, add that game mechanic. And um, I would suggest like you don't even have to use um dungeons and dragons there's tons of role-playing games out there that have different mechanics um in different gameplays and you know borrow from this one and take from that one and squish it together and see what you can get and then the other piece is encourage storytelling climate storytelling that is focused on the right things the the future the things we want in the future we want beautiful, green, lush worlds. We want clean rivers and we want just societies. And so, 
yeah, that's my talk on um, visioning collectively, um, discussing hope collectively, and how storytelling can supercharge our collective vision for what we want um, in the future. Again, you can find me, uh, Tori Stevens, on um, all the social sites, uh, social media sites. But the main thing I think, uh, if you want to get in contact with me, is through Imagine 2200, Climate Fiction for Future Ancestors. Thank you.